thing because we've got to play that other thing. Good morning, good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome to Christ Church. We're certainly glad to see you here this morning. Those of you that are here in the Centrum and those of you who are joining us online, my name's David Donathan, the Minister of Music here, and it's my joy to lead you this morning as we begin our service together. We're going to sing a couple songs to start our time, and the first one is entitled Gather Us In. It's in the Faith We Sing, number 2236, the black-covered um, supplement, song supplement book there next to your seat. So let's stand and sing number 2236, and we'll play through the first part of this to get this melody back in your ear. One, and a two. song this morning is Spirit of God over on uh, 2117 in that same book, uh, The Faith We Sing. Number 2117.
Let's gather our hearts together in a moment of prayer. Living and gracious God, it is a beautiful, beautiful morning, and we thank you so much for being present with us and for bringing us safely into your house or having the ability to join with you online. We ask that you help us to feel your presence during this time of worship, your love, your grace, and your forgiveness abound in everything that we do. So help us to take that love and grace and forgiveness out into the world, a world that oftentimes seems to be the exact opposite. Help us to be your light and your love and guide us in all that we do. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you would, turn to those around you and welcome them to worship this morning. Good to see everybody today on this beautiful morning. As we gather together today, we, we come in faith, we come in grace. As we gather, I, again, I welcome you again. I'm uh, Pastor Jay, lead pastor here. We're glad you're with us if you're joining online. And we invite you to go to our website at ccumwv.org where you can download a copy of our, our bulletin and all of the things we'll be doing in our worship today. Uh, so we're glad you're here with us. As we move through our order of worship, I want to share just a few uh, brief announcements with you. Uh, one of those being, of course, that our, uh, again, next week is a, is a big day. It's rally day uh, here at Christ Church, but uh, we will only be having one service. And so, again, we invite you to come for 11 o'clock and join in the, the service at 11 and then all the activities out here on Morris Street as we celebrate coming back together. 
Uh, also wanted to invite uh, Allison Bungard to come up and share with us today. Uh, we're revitalizing our Andrew ministry, uh, which is our ministry where we seek to provide uh, support to families as they go through a period of bereavement. And so I invite her to come up and, and share. Uh, Diana, if we could hit the podium mic. Good morning. As Jay indicated, uh, I'm here because we are trying to revitalize the Andrew ministry, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the name of my son. It's just pure coincidence. <laughs> um, even though many of you may not recognize the work of the Andrew ministry by the actual name of the ministry, most of us have actually been affected by the work of the Andrew ministry in some capacity, um, either because we had a family member who passed away or we um, have a friend who passed away. And the Andrew ministry is the, um, a very, very small group of women historically who have been providing refreshments and hospitality services for funeral receptions. Um, after someone's funeral service. So, um, as I said, historically, it's been a really small group of women, and they have done much of this work for decades, and I really mean decades. Um, they've done a wonderful job, and they've done this without complaint. Um, but given um, the age of some of them, they have asked us to engage in some succession planning so that we are in a position that we are always able to continue providing refreshments and hospitality when families are in need of it. So over the past few months, a group of us have been meeting about how we could reorganize and revitalize and expand the volunteers who participate in this ministry. Not only have we looked at what our church has done, but we've looked at what churches across the country have done. And I'll say that according to many websites, the Funeral Food and Hospitality Committee is often the largest group of volunteers in that particular church. Um, and, and many websites have just point blank said that. So we're hopeful that maybe um, that's what this can become as well. So we have some signups out um, in the North Texas this morning. And let me tell you a little bit about our volunteer roles and what we're envisioning. We, um, like many other churches, would put, like to put together funeral refreshment teams. These would be uh, rotating teams, so the team would change for each, each funeral, um, where people act, can either home make or they can go out and buy some type of prepared refreshment, and they bring it here to church and leave it for it to be used during the, the funeral reception. In addition, um, we are going to put together a list of substitutes. Um, you can be, you can either just substitute, you know, fill in for someone if, if they're not available uh, when their team's rotation is up, or you can um, even, if you're serving on a team, you can serve on as a substitute for another team. So we're, we're looking for substitutes as well. Um, we are also looking for people to lead these refreshment teams, um, and basically we're trying to have everything done um, as much in advance, because sometimes we don't necessarily get a lot of notice, um, but for example, that if I'm responsible on my team for bringing brownies, that that's what I'm responsible for bringing every time, so I can keep a few boxes of brownie mix at my house, so when I get that call, they're there, or I can run out to Kroger and either buy some some brownie mix, I know exactly what I need, or I can buy some prepared brownies. So we're trying to make this as easy as possible um, for, for people who, who um, do work and things like that during the week. We're also trying to put together a hospitality team. And to be on the hospitality team, you are not necessarily committing to serve at any given funeral. You'll be put on a list of people who will be notified when we're having a funeral. And if you happen to be available when that funeral reception is 
going on, then you could sign up to, to work that particular funeral. We would need set up teams to help set up tables, lay out the food, uh, prepare the drinks, um, get that set up. Um, people who would serve uh, by refilling plates and taking away empty plates, and then people who would clean up. Um, so when that happens, honestly, that's going to be about a four to five hour time commitment by the time you're looking at setup. And we're asking people, or set up through cleanup, and we're asking people if they can't fulfill the whole obligation to do this as a team so that somebody is replacing you for those other functions when you can't be there. Um, we um, are, are really excited about what we've put together. We've actually put together a brochure for grieving families um, explaining what we offer in terms of these services. And we've also put together a volunteer handbook that explains exactly what you need to do when your food needs to be here, what type of dishes are the best to bring it in, where you can pick up dishes. If you're on the laundry team cleaning the linens, where you pick them up, where you put them back. So we've put a lot of thought into what needs to be done in order for us to carry this out. So I'm really hopeful that some of you will um, sign up in the back to help us out and that we can start working on developing a large ministry to serve those who are often at you know, a point in time in their life when they need the most help that they've ever needed. Thank you. Thank you, Allison and your team and bringing that ministry together. I know often you know, working with uh, bereaved families, that meal is such a special part of their time together. And it's such a wonderful thing that we can provide for them, but we need, of course, some folks to help make that happen. And so I thank you for all your work that you've done with that. Uh, speaking of that, as we move into our prayer time, uh, of course, this week is uh, Bill Deal's service will be held here on Saturday. Uh, and so, again, we invite you to come out for that. Uh, you may have noticed his obituary in the, in the paper uh, this week, and it's such a great way of capturing Bill. I don't know if you saw that picture, but he's coming off an elevator with his hands up like this and just looks so excited. And he wanted this to be a celebration of life, so come and join with us in that this Saturday. Also, uh, of course, there are other prayer concerns in our life of our community, uh, some of those being those whom we've served through our assistance ministry. I want to share a few of those with you. Uh, one of them asked that we pray for their family. Uh, another one uh, another one asked for prayer for being in such a horrible situation. They're wrestling with cancer. Uh, there are many things going on in their lives. Uh, and so they asked us to be in prayer for that. Another one asked to pray for their best friend to overcome her addiction to drugs. So many of the folks in our community, of course, are, are wrestling with addictions. And so we want to remember those who are outside our walls that are wrestling with that. Uh, also, uh, I have the prayer concerns that were uh, shared uh, coming into the Centrum from you all today. I see many listed there, families and friends who are in great need. Uh, also, if you're joining us online, uh, we invite you to share your prayer concerns through the chat feature, uh, and then we will compile them with our prayer list that goes out early this week. So I'm going to lay those prayer concerns on our uh, altar table today as I light our prayer candle and we revisit uh, some music there that we were playing. Loving God, as we gather in your presence this morning, we come bearing the burdens of our hearts, the concerns of our minds, the struggles of our spirits. We think of those whom we love that are wrestling with loss or illness and difficulty. And so we lift them up to you, asking you to touch whatever their need may be, Bring that healing, that hope, that strength that they need in their lives today. 
But Lord, we also know we come carrying burdens that we place upon ourselves, carrying the pain of those that have wronged us, carrying with us the resentment from those who have hurt us in some way. We know we come as a forgiven people, but wrestle with sharing that forgiveness with others. We remember Joseph's story and how he forgave those who have harmed him so terribly. And we pray that we might have that same grace in our hearts. For we know that forgiveness is such an important and blessed thing. For in seeking to be a forgiven people, Lord, we express your spirit. So we pray that you would heal our hearts of the pain of those who have wronged us. That you'd help us to be healers and reconcilers in our world. Bringing that hope and love to all, no matter who they are. For we know that many of these conflicts raging across our planet, these conflicts at home and abroad, often come from a failure to forgive, a failure to reconcile, a failure to move past hurts. So help us, O oh God, to be those reconcilers, those who walk in the footsteps of your Son, our Savior, who showed us that pathway of forgiveness and grace, Jesus the Christ, who invites us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine's the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right. Might Ashley up to she I don't see any little ones, so she's gonna to need to get some adults to come up with her today. Who, who's yeah. feeling young at heart? All right. Yeah, I've I've got treats if somebody wants to come up here. Uh, in our scripture lesson today, uh, we're going to be talking about um, the story of Joseph from the book of Genesis. And that's a large story, but what Jay's going to focus on is, is the end uh, when Joseph is faced with a choice. Uh, he has to choose whether or not to forgive his family, his brothers, who had wronged him so horribly so many times when he was younger. And... Um, in preparing for this, I brought some lemons this morning because when we're wronged by somebody, when we feel hurt, when we feel that we've been betrayed, uh, we become bitter, we become sour, we become hardened. And God doesn't want that for us. He doesn't want that for our lives, but he doesn't want us to project that out because not only do we become bitter to ourselves, we become bitter to those who have wronged us and others around us. It can, it can spread just like when you're cutting a lemon on the, lemon, on the board. But when Joseph is faced with this decision, he decides to forgive his brothers and forgiveness is the sweetest thing that can come from our lives. So you have to think of forgiveness like the sugar on the lemons. It sweetens it up. It makes it tolerable. It makes it pleasant even. Um, and the sweetness is what we need to add to our lives. It's what we need to add to the forgiveness um, that comes whenever we, we become bitter and sour. So... I hope that was a good illustration for you guys this morning. Again, if you would like to bite into a sour lemon and then one covered in sugar to see the difference, if you don't trust me, I'm more than welcome. To, I'm more than happy to share. But if you would join with me while I say a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for forgiving us. You choose to forgive us each and every time we ask for it. Help us to be like Joseph and to forgive others so we can add sweetness to the life around us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, Ashley. As we continue to move forward, I know I jumped the gun on some of the announcements. I was trying to allow uh, Allison to do what she needs to do. She'll be coming back and doing it again at our um, 
our 11 o'clock service. Again, main thing was Rally Day. I want you to be aware of that. Uh, also, we have an initiative coming up in September that I think will have the power to help revitalize our church as we move into the, our, really our big part of the church year that begins in September. It's a breakthrough prayer initiative. And it's a prayer initiative that's going on throughout our annual conference. We'll be joining with sister churches throughout the West Virginia and Garrett County, Maryland. As we come together and focus on a prayer as a community. Again, I know Labor Day is not the best time to kick stuff off. But we're going to kick off the sermon series then. But we also invite you to come on the 10th when we really engage in, from that point forward, a 28-day prayer experience for everybody in the congregation. To pray a prayer together, to do studies together. Watch for more information about that. I'm convinced it will be transformative for us as individuals and also as a community of faith. So be sure uh, to watch for that information. Uh, you also see there are other things happening. We're recruiting acolytes and uh, things like that. But I, I think this fall promises to be a, a powerful time for us here at Christ Church. Again, I offer you our, your, our thanks for your generosity in sponsoring all the ministries that we have. This summer, I think some of the key things we were able to do were Uh, addressing ministries with our little ones. If you remember that camp we had where the kids uh, were able to make a lap dulcimer and learn about Appalachian culture, that's not possible without your your generosity in helping make that happen. And our youth going to Pikeville and all those wonderful ministries are solely able to do so because of your generosity and your giving. So now as we share our tithes and offerings, we have a special song uh, that we'll be doing called uh, Forgiveness. It's kind of our theme for today, if you haven't noticed, uh, but we're looking forward to playing it for you. Everything you have to say a word forgiveness forgiveness it flies in the face of all your pride it moves away the mad inside it always angers own worst enemy even when the jury judge say you've got a right to hold a grudge it whispers in your ear saying set it free forgiveness forgiveness Show me how. 
Thank you, David, and the, the rest of the band. I, I like that one. Our lesson for today comes to us from the first book in the Bible in Genesis. It's chapter 45, verses 1 to 15. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I'm your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it's not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord of all his house, and a ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there since there are five more years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And while Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all of his brothers and wept upon them, and after that his brothers talked with him. These are words of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, as we gather this day, I I pray as always that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight you who ever and always are our rock our redeemer our forgiver and our power amen he kissed all his brothers and he wept upon them so ends the saga of joseph and his brothers You know, Thomas Mann once wrote or said that Genesis is a book about dysfunctional families. And in many aspects, Joseph's story is kind of the the climax of that family craziness. Of course, if we know anything about families, families are always kind of difficult. A friend of mine always said the family are the people in your lives that you didn't choose. 
And so you have to, to learn to grow and be together. And those complexities of family life grow exponentially in a patriarchal, polygamous family like Jacob's. I mean, he had all these favorites. He, he liked Rachel best among all of his wives. And of his 12 sons and daughters, he, he liked Joseph best. And of course, it's no coincidence that Joseph was the son of Rachel. But most of us know his story of how he was a dreamer and he had these dreams. How his father gave him a, a code of either many colors or long sleeves, the translations vary, but gave him a special coat. And how his 11 brothers got sick and tired of the, their father's favoritism. And so one day when Jacob sends Joseph to check on what they're doing and whether they're doing a good job out watching the sheep, his brother's resentment boils over. And they decide to, to beat some humility into them, but things rapidly escalate out of control, as so often happens when mob rule takes over. And before they realize what they're doing, they, they've thrown him into a pit, and then they've sold him to some slave traders. And then after realizing what they've done, they decide to, to cover it up. They, they get some goat's blood and drag that pretty coat through it and then take it back to their father telling them that wild beast had killed him. Pretty dysfunctional. But then we fast forward to now. And it's been a decade or two. Joseph by now is probably a fading memory for the family that he didn't want to leave behind. They probably figure he's been dead for a long time, whether they believe the wild animal story or even knew the, what really happened. But now a terrible famine has come to the land, and so desperate times call for desperate measures, and Jacob sends his sons to Egypt to broker a grain deal with Pharaoh's chief of staff. But little did they know that this Egyptian official, Pharaoh's right-hand man, is none other than their brother, Joseph. Somehow, against all odds, he has survived, and, and not only survived, he has prospered. And through an unlikely series of events, he's gone from slave to prisoner to now prime minister. And during that time, you know, Joseph had, had plenty of time to brood, to think about his brothers and what they'd done to him. And now, quite unexpectedly, the day has come. They're there. He finds himself face to face with all of them. And like that dream long ago when he was a kid, they were bowing down before him. He has absolute power. Imagine what was running through his mind. You know, they say revenge is a dish best served cold. And I think if that's true, that room probably felt like a deep freeze. Because all he had to do was call the palace guard and without questioning they'd send those brothers into that same prison he had languished in before. He could have even sent them to the slave market. He could have killed them if he wanted. But then Joseph examines the faces of his brothers. They still don't recognize him. But my guess is they'd probably changed a bit. Their faces more aged and, and windblown down through the years. Reuben's probably losing his hair. Simon's brow is filled with wrinkles. Isachar may be walking with a limp. Judah's beard's filled with flecks of gray. They've changed. And so is he. And in that moment, uh, unexpectedly and against all odds... Joseph feels that tie that binds them all together. That despite all that they had done to him, despite all the trials he had gone through, the slavery, the prison, the whole nine yards, now somehow after all of these decades, all Joseph could think about was what they had in common. These brothers he has long imagined as prideful and powerful now seem small and weak. They've had their share of troubles too. And so I think that in that moment, living in a world where it's eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, that that's the rule of the day, Joseph realizes that he doesn't have to repeat 
that grim cycle. That cycle of revenge and and violence. And that if he didn't stop it, no one ever would. Send everyone away, he commands. Now my guess at that point, the brothers began wondering even more. What's this all about? I mean, here's this Egyptian on the golden throne, clad in elegant garments, his eyes ochred, his jet black hairpiece secured with a circle of gold, looking back at them with the strangest expression on his face. And then suddenly he's standing and he's coming down the steps. And they see that there's tears running down his cheeks. And he looks over these 11 sons of Jacob. And he gestures for them to come in closer to him. And then in a voice barely above a whisper, he says, I'm Joseph. Is my father still alive? The eleven, I'm sure, were speechless. But then the next words he speaks are so full of compassion. Leading to that remarkable line, God sent me here before you to preserve life. After all those years of licking emotional wounds and perhaps dreaming of revenge, Joseph has caught a higher vision. And that vision is not of revenge, but of life. For he now realizes that his true vocation has been to be there so that the the message of God's love could continue to the next generation. And so standing there on that beautiful mosaic floor, he gives them absolution. All that anger has left him. Because he's learned that blood and love are much thicker than anger. On the one hand, this story of reconciliation looks like it's not very fair. Angered parties should be expected to exact payment for crimes committed against them. That's the way it is in a world based on retribution. Yet Joseph demonstrates a higher way. He demonstrates this way of forgiveness. Forgiving others, especially when the wound is deep, is one of the hardest things any of us will ever be called to do. Yet at the same time, I think no task is more important, not only for the person being forgiven, but also for the person doing the forgiving Because as a wise person has said, forgiveness is when you set a prisoner free and then you realize that prisoner is yourself. There's lots of stories of forgiveness. They abound in our personal lives. They abound in other writings. But one that has always struck me is the story of Amy Beale. And it's not really a story about her, but about her parents. You see, Amy grew up in First Presbyterian Church in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She was active in her Sunday school. She sang in the youth choir, and she did all of those things. And as a college student, she was the kind of young woman who made her parents proud. She was a straight-A student and a college diving champion. But she had a great passion in her life. And that passion was South Africa. And so when she went to school in the early 90s, she worked to keep the anti-apartheid cause before her classmates. She had free Mandela stickers on her backpack, and those words always came out of her mouth. And then when she won a Fulbright scholarship, no one was surprised when she went to South Africa. And then she immersed herself in that troubled country's culture and politics. But her life ended tragically when she was stoned and stabbed to death by a mob of angry militants. Because you see, to them, she was just a white oppressor. And they had no idea that they were really killing a friend of their cause. It was another one of those tragic, senseless acts of violence. As you can imagine, Amy's parents were devastated by the news. But instead of lashing out in anger, they tried to learn 
what their daughter would have wanted. They read her diaries. They began to learn about South Africa. And the more they read and studied, the more they were determined to continue her legacy, so they went to South Africa. Amy's mother, Linda, attended the trial of her attackers. They visited the, those camps, those townships in all their poverty where Amy's killers had grown up. And they began to sense the pain that was there and the frustration. But Linda even visited the mother of one of the murderers. And as she sat a while with the man's mother, she told her that she forgave her son for what he had done. She later told the reporters at 60 Minutes after hugging the woman, I walked out of that home and there was a rainbow in the sky. My heart was light. I'd come to terms. And if that's forgiveness, I felt it, she said. And then she and her family went on to create an institute, a foundation that's doing ministries and programs in South Africa. The family became widely known and famed Archbishop Tutu said in admiration they'd have turned it all upside down. It's the victims in the depth of their own agony and pain who are saying the community which produced these murderers we want to help that community be transfigured. And as a matter of fact, one of the first children enrolled in one of the after-school programs funded by the Beale Foundation was the 12-year-old sister of one of the murderers. They understood what Joseph came to understand. I know it's an incredible story, but is it more incredible than a man being thrown into a pit and sold into slavery and then has his oppressors right in the palm of his hand but chooses to forgive them all of this goes against the ethic that has governed our world for centuries that one that even our Lord Jesus renounced the retribution and exacting revenge we often think forgiveness may seem pitifully weak and soft on justice but I think there's nothing stronger or more determined because I don't think that forgiveness condones the wrong it doesn't condone the wrong that has been done it doesn't forget it but it openly acknowledges that past offense but then it tries to move on always as Joseph said to seek to preserve life and enhance it. Someone has written, only the brave know how to forgive, and I, I think that's true because it takes great courage to do that. Sometimes it's easier to try to carry that baggage of anger on our shoulders. But Joseph discovered the power of, of love to work in his life, just like Amy's parents did, and that love can be bigger and stronger than hatred. And whereas his brothers intended his harm, God intended it for good. And it is through that grace of God, that grace we see in Jesus, that was able to transform that hatred into love. And I think such forgiveness can work in our lives as well. We can use forgiveness when a co-worker undermines us. We can use forgiveness when a friend disappoints. We can remember forgiveness when someone hurts us. Then though forgiveness might not be easy, it's always life-giving. But you know, forgiveness is, is often private. It's a quiet thing that we do, but it can be very public. And I think that's important too because forgiveness expressed or a desire for, for reconciliation and wholeness expressed publicly is God's work in the world. Jewish theologians call it takun olam, the healing of creation. 
And whenever we see this healing, we see this reconciliation, the binding of hearts broken and betrayed, we see God at work. And that's what we're called to do, to join God in this work. This week, the Council on Churches has called us to a special week, an ecumenical prayer for those incarcerated, And for correctional staff, we've seen the statistics. Our governor had to declare a state of emergency for correctional officers. We see so often stories of the hardships in our prisons and our jails and our overcrowding. Part of this issue of reconciliation is seeking to address that in a way that doesn't ignore the harm. It seeks to move towards reconciliation and forgiveness. That model that the Beals give us over in South Africa. So my sisters and brothers, I invite us now to join in the prayer that the Council of Churches has shared with us. The response is, Lord, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we give you thanks for this time in which to remember your love and care for all of humanity. Help us to remember your love for those who have been the victims of crime, that they may find healing and support. Your compassion on those who are incarcerated, that they may find their way back to right relationships. And your mercy to those whose calling is to care for both. Please remember their families, friends, and neighbors who also bear these burdens. For our governor, the members of our two legislative bodies, and all the judges in the court system here in West Virginia, that they might uphold their duty to provide humane living conditions for all those in our prisons, dignity and respect to all women, men, and youth who are incarcerated, and ease of reentry for those leaving incarceration. We pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For the relationships affected by our criminal justice system, grandparents caring for grandchildren, spouses missing their partners, and children separated from their parents, that they may find hope and reconciliation. We pray to the Lord. For those men and women who are employed in the state prison system, that they receive just wages and compensation, commensurate with the difficult challenges of their worthy jobs, that our prisons are able to provide the staffing needed to maintain healthy and safe living conditions for staff and inmates, we pray to the Lord. For those serving time and those reentering their communities after incarceration, that this may be a time of reflection, repentance, redemption, and reconciliation. We pray to the Lord. For individuals, families, and communities impacted by crime, may they know that they are not forgotten. May they find healing in your love and support from those close to them. We pray to the Lord. For all of us fortunate enough to have to not have to endure the many indignities that are a part of prison life, that in our appreciation for this grace of God, our walk may be one of love toward our neighbors. We pray to the Lord. Lord Jesus, you know what it is to be held captive. We pray for all those men, women, and youth whose lives are forever changed by their lives in prison. May they always be aware of your presence with them. And may your spirit bring them peace and the hope of new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Also included in your bulletin, there are some notes on ministries that churches can engage in to help facilitate that reconciliation and re-entry of those coming to our communities from prison. I invite us all to pray and reflect on that and think about maybe what God is calling us to do to help those who are part of humanity 
who need forgiveness. Let's now join in our closing hymn. Don't bind us together. Now may the grace of God, the great forgiver, surround us with that spirit of forgiveness as we go forth into this world to share love with others, even those who've wronged us. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.